Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhut Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitiramini Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Prachat Nirvichaya Chum Achatya Dejitarini Chaitanya Prabhu Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> This is a description of the appearance of Lord Varaha extraordinary form of a boar and this form is completely spiritual so in different ways the description is being given who is describing to whom Maitreya to Vidura, specifically these verses, these are prayers being offered by the sages who assembled for the sake of solving the problem of Swayambhuva Manu. Swayambhuva Manu, when he was uh, instructed by Brahma to generate the population, then he found that the resting place, the res place of residence for the population is the earth. And the earth planet is submerged in the Rasatala region. So Swayambhuva Manu approached Brahma and Brahma said he is unable to do anything to rescue the earth. So then Brahma prayed to the Supreme Lord and the Supreme Lord appeared as Varaha. Avatar and Varaha Avatar, uh, the form is completely transcendental. It's not an ordinary boar. Due to so many reasons, we can understand why it is not just an ordinary boar. Lord Varaha was situated in the sky. We don't have any boar situated in the sky with material form. No. Then Lord Varaha's size, what is the size of the form? Initially, when he appeared out of Brahma's nostril, he was very, very small. But then he started growing in size and he covered the upper sky in the upper three planetary systems. Janaloka, Tapoloka and Satyaloka. And all the residents of these three planetary systems could see Lord Varaha. Because he was situated in the sky with such a big form. They could see. And then they recognized that particular form to be the form of the Lord. How did they recognize? First of all, what did they here, roaring of Lord Varaha. That roar was identified as a transcendental sound. Now who can identify a transcendental sound? Those who are transcendentalists. Just like some Russian will be speaking some Russian language. Who can identify that? Those who know Russian language. Others think some, something is speaking. I don't know what he's speaking. Similarly, when the Lord roared, that roaring was heard <coughs> throughout the universe. <coughs> throughout the universe, that roaring was heard. 
But it was identified by the sages of the upper three planetary systems. So they identified that sound as the sound of the Vedic hymns. And therefore they began to offer prayers by glorifying the Lord by reciting Vedic hymns. Then the Lord acknowledged a second time by roaring, Yes, I am the Supreme Lord and these prayers are meant for me. And then he went diving into the Garbhodaka ocean and the water splashed because it was a very big form, very easily he was able to reach the bottom of the Rasatala region inside the Garbhodaka ocean. And he saw the earth lying there as it was before the dissolution happened. So he lifted the earth simply by using his tusks. And the earth is a huge planet. 6,400 kilometers in diameter. How much? 12,800. No, it should be more than that. Huh? Periphery, okay. Still. 12,800 kilometer big ball is being lifted between the tusks. So his tusk will be Distance between the tusks will be 12,800 kilometers. North pole to south pole. <clears throat> hmm? So that huge gigantic form of the boar, that is because he is the Supreme Lord. Appearing for the specific purpose of rescuing the earth. And he did it very graciously, gracefully, very gracefully he did it, effortlessly he lifted and he placed it in the right position in its orbit. All the planets are situated in a particular position in their own orbit. And the Brahma Samhita describes Yasyagnaya Brahmati Samrita Kala Chakro. Because Brahma Samhita describes the sun. But all the planets are in their position, rotating in their orbit, according to the order of Kala, which is the order of the Supreme Lord. Hmm? So because when they rotate, that is the basis of the day and night, Kala, the measurement of time in each planet is based on the planet's distance from the sun and the planet's movement in its orbit. Two factors, at least, if not more. So, this was done by the Lord because Lord Brahma prayed to the Lord in answer to Lord Brahma's prayers. The Lord appeared. Now the sages are glorifying the Lord. And they are describing the Lord's form as completely transcendental. Completely spiritual. So how are they identifying the different limbs or the parts of the transcendental form? Uh, the repetition of your appearance is the desire for all kinds of initiation. Diksha. Diksha, Prabhu, uh, Prabhupada describes as spiritual birth. Spiritual birth. When we take initiation, we are supposed to get a second birth. Spiritual birth. The second birth is a spiritual birth. So it is described in the scriptures that the second birth, Dvija, uh, one who has taken initiation is called Dvija in second birth. <clears throat> that second birth is through the agency of the spiritual master as the spiritual father 
and Vedas as the mother. Always birth means mother and father, at least for a human being. So, who is the mother and who is the father for the second birth? First birth we know, mother and father. So, second birth, the mother and father are the Vedas and this spiritual master, bona fide spiritual master. So, there are different kinds of initiation in the traditional Vedic system for the sake of offering different kinds of sacrifice to the Lord. So, in this purport that I read, there are seven kinds of routine yajnas performed by all followers of the Vedic rituals. And they are called Agnishtoma, Atyagnishtoma, Ukta, Shodashi, Vajapeya, Atiratra and Aptoryama. <clears throat> so, the purpose of such yajnas is supposed to be, uh, when anyone performing such yajnas regularly is supposed to be situated with the Lord. Material existence means forgetfulness of the Lord. And spiritual initiation and spiritual practice is meant to revive our contact with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord, our situation with the Lord. That is the purpose of initiation. That is the purpose of the uh, practice, spiritual practice after initiation. So, therefore, the repetition of his appearance is the desire for all kinds of initiation. So whenever the living being uh, forgets his eternal duty or eternal activity, uh, dharma, that Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita. Yada yada hi dharmasya glani. I appear whenever there is dharmasya glani. Uh, glani can be understood as neglect. Glani can be understood as... What is the translation? Yada yada hi dharmasya glani bhavati varata. Word for meaning. Glani hi. Discrepancies. Either people are not following properly the process of dharma, they are manufacturing or they are concocting or they are uh, neglecting to fo properly follow or people become godless. Another place Prabhupada explains, godless civilization. Then the Lord appears <coughs> and when he appears, he initiates people into the process of dharma. He initiates people in the process of dharma. So, that initiation is described as the beginning of spiritual life. Proper, regulated spiritual life. The beginning is called initiation. And then, your neck is the place for three kinds of desires. What are the three kinds of desires? Sambandha, Abhideya and Prayojana. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes all the Vedas are aiming at helping us understand these three kinds of uh, purposes of the Vedas. Hmm? We should understand what is our relationship? We are all individuals. So we have relationship with the Supreme Lord and we have a relationship with everything else in relationship with the Supreme Lord. Hmm. So uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains the relationship with the Supreme Lord is primarily one of service, devotional service. And the relationship with everything else is understood to be one of 
ಯುಕ್ತ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ಯುಕ್ತ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಯುಕ್ತ ವೈರಾಗ್ಯ ಹೌ ಟು ಎಂಗೇಜ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಲ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ಹೌ ಟು ಎಂಪ್ಲಾಯ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ದಟ್ ಸಂಬಂಧ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ then when the sambandha is understood when the relationship is understood then there are activities in that relationship uh, if a person joins a particular organization or a institution depending on his position which is defining the relationship then here there will be specific activities he has to perform if he has joined the sales department he has got activities of sales if he has joined the production department he has got activities of production correct so the activities are dependent upon the relationship so proper says when the relationship is understood then the relative function begins right now we are having activities but in ignorance we are doing so many activities i think i am the lord of all i survey and naturally when i think i am the lord i want to lord over everything that i can lord over whereas chaitanya mahaprabhu explains you are not the lord you are the servant of the lord the lord is krishna uh, so this misunderstanding of who we are or what our relationship is with everything this is the cause of all our problems so therefore the three kinds of uh, purposes of the vedas is to define explain make us understand who you are and who you are should be understood in terms of relationship it is not enough to just know i am spirit soul aham brahmasmi the mayavadis they stress on this aham brahmasmi but they do not know as brahman what is your relationship with everything else in existence especially what is your relationship with the supreme absolute truth so the mayavadi's misunderstanding is sarvam khalvidam brahma everything is brahman so they think everything is brahman therefore we are the absolute truth we are god so when somebody thinks i am god where is the question of relationship there is no relationship with god if i am god then where is the relationship that is not correct understanding when the shastras say everything is brahman it's understood that everything is of the same quality of the supreme lord who is the supreme brahman who is the owner and controller and enjoyer and possessor of everything ಈಶಾವಾಸ್ಯಮಿದಂ ಸರ್ವಂ ಯತ್ಕಿಂಚ ಜಗತ್ಯಾಂ ಜಗತ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವೈ ದಿಸ್ ಈಶೋ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಇಸ್ ಸೋ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಅಮಂಗ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ದಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಈಶಾ ಈಶಾವಾಸ್ಯೋಪನಿಷತ್ ಆರ್ ಈಶೋ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ಸ್ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಪ್ರೊಪ್ರೈಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ನಾಟ್ ದ ಲಿವಿಂಗ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ಸ್ the living beings themselves are part of the lord owned by the lord krishna describes this in the fourth chapter as transcendental knowledge hmm? what does he say about transcendental knowledge ha huh? no fourth chapter yad gyatva na punar moham ಎಂ ಯಾಸಿ ಪಾಂಡವ ಸರ್ವೂತಿ ಅಶೇಷಾ ದ್ರಕ್ಷಸಿ ಆತ್ಮನಿ 
atomai. Translation? Venugopal, read the translation. Three things Krishna says. All living beings are part of B. They are part of the Supreme Lord. All living beings. So this defines a relationship. Prabhupada says, what is the relationship? Relationship between the part and the whole. Just like his finger is part of this entire body. Now finger, as long as it is connected to the body, you can say finger is also body. But the finger has got a specific function as part of this body. The finger has got its function. Every part of the body has got its function. Hmm? Now, the body itself is body provided all the parts are connected with the body. Moment a part gets disconnected from the body, there is no meaning to that part being called anymore as part of the body. Just like the finger, if it is cut off and some piece of this finger is lying somewhere, will somebody identify it as finger? No. Why? Because it cannot perform the function of the finger. Anything disconnected from, any part disconnected from the whole cannot do the function of the part in the whole. Similarly, if we are disconnected from Krishna, we cannot be disconnected from Krishna, but if we forget Krishna, and in that forgetfulness, we think I am independent, or I am separate, or I have no connection with Krishna, then we cannot do our function. When we don't perform our function, then that is called dharmasya glani. Dharmasya glani. And as soon as there is dharmasya glani, abhyutthanam adharmasya, then there is increased irreligion, adharma. And adharma means so many problems, so many difficulties. So, in order to correct this situation of adharma, situation of dharmasya glani, the Lord appears again and again, repeated appearance, and He establishes these three things, sambandha, abhideya, and prayojana. So, abhideya, as I explained, is relative function, relative duties, relative activities. So, if your servant the relative function or relative activities are that of service. Service to whom? Service to the Lord. And what kind of service? That service is employing everything in the Lord's service. For the Lord. That is service. Service is not some concoction. <clears throat> some speculation, some theory. That is not service. Proper service is in relationship with the Lord. Everything has a relationship with the Lord. What is that? Everything is owned and controlled and meant for the Lord's pleasure, Lord's enjoyment. So you employ everything for the Lord's pleasure. It rightfully belongs to Krishna, should be used for Krishna. So, our understanding of everything is Brahman is, everything belongs to the Supreme Brahman. So, everything should be used for the Supreme Brahman. That is the explanation in the fourth chapter, 24th words. Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnau, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadhina. This is Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Bhagavad Gita explains what is the meaning of that statement in the Vedanta Sutra, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. What does Bhagavad Gita say? Brahmarpanam, 
in the spiritual conception when one is properly situated in transcendental knowledge then one recognizes everything as ultimately spiritual nothing is material even in this world and matter regains its spiritual quality only when matter is employed in service of the supreme lord through sacrifice that's what the third chapter says yagnyarthat karmanah all work should be done as sacrifice huh? sacrifice means to please vishnu to please vishnu that is sacrifice so you employ everything for the pleasure of the lord in his service that is yagna so how is such yagna done the understanding is that everything is ultimately spiritual nothing is material so in a perfect sacrifice krishna describes brahmarpanam brahmahavir brahmagno brahmanahutam uh, everything is of the quality of brahman everything is the quality of the supreme lord quality spiritual by quality so then what happens the the sacrifice results in culminates in ultimately everything being consumed in the fire of sacrifice in a fire sacrifice when do we say the sacrifice is successful when whatever is offered is consumed in the sacrifice why what is the understanding of something being consumed in the sacrifice just like atheists and non devotees they think that you are wasting ghee grains uh, by pouring it into a fire and calling it as a sacrifice yes you are sacrificing but the result of sacrifice is simply it is burned to ashes for nobody's benefit what they don't understand is fire is the mouth of the supreme lord fire is the mouth which form of the supreme lord fire is the mouth ha huh? universal form ha huh? universal form of the lord fire is the mouth so when you offer something to somebody to consume where do you put it in the mouth so offering something in the fire in a sacrifice is offering to the supreme lord and the scriptures describe agni one of his main functions is to carry whatever we offer in a fire sacrifice to the supreme lord he is the carrier he reaches it to the lord so uh, these are all the subtle aspects or the finer understanding of what is a fire sacrifice it is not merely the ritual of uh, igniting a fire and then pouring some ghee or grains no it is not just a ritual like that hmm? the supreme lord is accepting whatever is offered for the purpose for which it is offered the purpose is to please the lord uh, so when there is proper understanding of the relationship sambandha abhideya and prayojana prayojana is ultimate goal what is the ultimate goal to awaken our original love for krishna the supreme lord to awaken that bhakti that is the goal of all such sacrifices all these vedic rituals uh, so therefore it is described the neck is the place of lord varaha this description of lord varaha's transcendental form the neck is a place for three kinds of desires and your tusks are the result of initiation the tusks of the lord varaha 
is the result of initiation. What is the result of initiation? Result of initiation is one begins spiritual activities uh, with the proper understanding. Earlier also somebody might have been active, but those activities were activities in ignorance. Karma bandhana. The result of acting in ignorance is simply people are bound up, entangled materially. But as soon as they begin spiritual activities with proper understanding of the relationship, immediately they are being freed from the material bondage. Immediately. They are being freed from material bondage. Uh, and you are progressing towards your ultimate liberation. Ultimate liberation. Uh, so, uh, the result of initiation is described here. End of all desires. No more confusion. Otherwise, material desires means they are all self-contradictory. All material desires are like that. Why? Because material desires, uh, at least in the human form of life, one desires freedom from bondage. And what do material desires do? They increase the bondage. So therefore, all material desires are self-contradictory. People pursue material desires because they want to be happy. But what is the result of uh, fulfillment of material desires? What does Bhagavad Gita say? Hmm? That is Rajoguna, happiness in the mode of Rajoguna. Uh, but what does uh, fifth chapter say about material desires? Yehi samsparshaja bhoga dukha yonaya evate. All material desires, when they are fulfilled, they end up in misery. Dukha yoni. They are the source of all miseries, they result only in misery. So, it is just the opposite. So, end of all desires means no more material desire, only spiritual desire. And spiritual desire means simply desire to please the Lord. Simply desire to please the Lord, that's all. Your tongue is the prior activities of initiation. Before initiation, one has to prepare oneself. Because after initiation, one initiation means one takes vows. Just like we take vows, no more uh, meat eating, no more intoxication after initiation, no more illicit sex, no more gambling. And I will chant every day 16 rounds of Hare Krishna mantra. Similarly, in the other traditional uh, uh, fire sacrifices also, they take vows. Just like I heard when we had been to Guruvayur, the head priest who does the morning offering to the Lord, the worship and the different offerings, etc., he will not take even one drop of water till noon from morning 3 a.m. How many hours is that? Nine hours. And he is bound by that, Diksha. He is initiated into it. And he is bound by that. So, these uh, vows, hmm, one has to prepare before one takes the vows. So that prior activities of initiation, puraschariya, they are also called puraschariya. Purification of some old habits that might have been there. Somebody might be habituated to drinking water in the morning as soon as they get up. Yeah. But, if somebody wants to worship the Lord according to that system of worship in the temple, in that temple, traditionally it has been established and discontinuing. So then, they should take a vow, I will not drink any water till the worship is over. So this is uh, prior activities of initiation, this preparation. 
for taking this diksha. Any sacrifice, actually, the performer of the sacrifice is bound by certain rules. So, uh, that is called prior activities of initiation. They say, we say sankalpa. Sankalpa. Hmm? The sankalpa is very important in spiritual life. Hmm? Just like uh, uh, worship, we do what is called a sankalpa before worshipping the Lord. That's also called establishing oneself in yoga. So, we are bound up. I am not going to divert my attention away from the activity that I am going to perform. Let's say I am going to do arati. So, my full concentration attention is going to be on the arati. So, for preparation of the arati, I should have the paraphernalia. I should have prepared the, the place. The paraphernalia required, I should have procured. Whatever, arranging. Arranging the, the lamp, the uh, incense, the water, the argya, the, all, everything. The bell, the achaman cup, everything has to be arranged. So, this is actually every day when we go for worship, we are actually taking diksha. We are taking diksha by making a sankalpa. Therefore, we invoke the blessings of the spiritual master. The blessings of the spiritual master. That he gives permission. Yes. Because he is the authority to permit us to offer the worship to the Lord. Anybody can't just go and simply worship the Lord. It's not possible. So all this is simplified by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for the fallen souls of Kali Yuga. That he has initiated everybody. Chant Hare Krishna. He has initiated everybody. Chant Hare Krishna. No need for any qualification. No need for any prior preparation. No need to even take a vow. In the beginning, there is no need for taking vow. You simply chant Hare, you vibrate your tongue and say, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. In this way you worship the Lord. In this way you offer sacrifice. Yajnai Sankirtana Prayer Yajantihi Sumedasaha. Bhagavatam 11th Canto describes. So, uh, in an earlier purport, yesterday's purport, the previous verse, Prabhupada describes that nobody can follow all the strict rules and regulations for performing the traditional sacrifice, fire sacrifice, the seven types of sacrifice that's described here. What are the difficulties? We can't get the ingredients. We don't have qualified brahmanas who can properly chant the mantras. Hmm? We are not qualified to follow all the restrictions for performing this yajna. So, so many uh, difficulties are there in this Kali Yuga. So, therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us, based on the scriptural uh, directions, that in Kali Yuga, only one type of sacrifice is recommended, and that is Sankirtan Yajna. And no other sacrifice is practically possible to be performed accurately, properly, with all details. Now there are so many shortcuts for doing this fire sacrifice. Hmm? But that is not the proper way to do sacrifice. The proper way to do sacrifice is to follow strictly all the recommendations. So therefore in Kali Yuga only Sankirtan Yajna. Hmm? So like this, in describing Lord Varaha's form as the form 
of the Lord who accepts all types of sacrifices. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna simplifies and says, Aham hi sarva yajnanam bhokta cha prabhureva cha. We open that verse, ninth chapter. Most confidential knowledge. Krishna only is there. Bhokta, enjoyer of all sacrifices. Sarva yajnana. Bhokta cha prabhureva cha. He is the master, he is the controller. And the enjoyer of all types of sacrifices described in the scriptures. What is the verse number? Huh? 24, 9.24. Naresha, read the translation. Those who don't recognize my true transcendental nature. Transcendental nature of the Lord is that sacrifices are meant for Him. He's the enjoyer. When we say Indra Yajna, uninformed people will think it is meant for Indra. Krishna tells in the ninth chapter, it is not meant for Indra. It's meant for Krishna. And Krishna, in order to teach this lesson that Indra Yajna is not meant for Indra, it's meant for Krishna. What did Krishna tell the Brajavasis? Perform Govardhan Puja. You see? And Indra also forgot. Sometimes Indra forgets. Not always. But sometimes Indra forgets. Let me God, sometimes they forget. Krishna is the enjoyer of all sacrifice. So Indra forgot, so in order to show mercy upon Indra, to remind him that these sacrifices are not meant for you, they are meant for me. Krishna wanted to remind Indra. For Indra's benefit. Huh? Then Indra was reminded by Krishna performing the pastime of lifting Govardhan Hill. And then Indra came and offered prayers and begged forgiveness from the Lord. So, aham hi sarva yajnana bhokta cha prabhu revacha. So, Lord Varaha is the supreme Lord. He is the object of all sacrifices. Therefore, the sages are glorifying the Lord as the object of all sacrifices, as the form of sacrifice, as the form of the object of all sacrifices. That's the description given in these uh, prayers offered by the sages who recognize the Lord as the transcendental Lord, uh, the Supreme Lord, and not just uh, some uh, um, ordinary bore or any creature of this world. No, not a creature of this world, but the Supreme Lord appearing in this form for the specific purpose of rescuing the earth. Okay? I'll stop here. Rantara Srimad Bhagavatam ki jaya shla prabhupad ki jaya.